Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is November already. Uh, at the end of this month, this very month, at the end, we're going to decorate the sanctuary for Advent and Christmas. You know, the calendar moves blink, and the calendar moves ahead about three or four months. That's the way it is. We have one announcement card out, Jackie Schultz. Good morning, everybody. I see that you made it this morning. Got your clock set right. Um, next week, Rose Jensen, our community health nurse, will be here for a presentation on fall prevention. So I want to ask you a few questions this morning. It's not a test. You don't have to answer out loud. But please think back. Um, have any of these situations caused you to fall? Did you get your foot caught on the carpeting or a throw rug? Did you trip on a crack in the sidewalk, slip in the shower, stumble in the grass, slip or slide on the ice, miss the last step on the stairway while you were running down? Uh, were you unexpectedly dizzy? Uh, did you lose your balance? or did your knee just collapse? So these are only a few reasons of why many of us have taken a fall. Um, falls cause all kinds of injuries, anywhere from a knee scrape to a sprain, sta strain, um, broken bones, and sometimes serious injuries that can cause death. So it can be, <clears throat> it doesn't have to just be an older person, any person can fall, and it can cause us some problems. So we've all had some information, I think, about fall prevention. We know some things already, but the thing is we don't always do it. We um, always think we can just um, do it another way. Uh, for example, uh, I know a woman who's in her 80s who um, does get on the ladder and clean the leaves out of the gutter every year. And um, I, that person is familiar to me because it is me. <laughs> so. Um, Rose is going to be here, and hopefully she's going to give us some new information that will help to keep us upright and safer. So that's next week. We'll be in the lower level uh, conference room. See you there. As you were able, please rise for our call to worship. Our call to worship is the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Shut 
and hover, see the cloud and fire appear for a glory and a cover, showing that their God is near. Thus deriving from their banner, light by night and shade by day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Be upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Let us each confess before God from the silence of our heart. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, God gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Before the reading from the scriptures, let us pray. You are our God for all generations. May we hear your voice and love with your love. Amen. This week's Old Testament reading comes from Psalm 146, verses 2 through 10, which begins on page 544 of your Pew Bible. In what is very timely for this week, Psalm 146 speaks about the limitations of human government and about the limitlessness of God. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes in mortals in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. 
Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. This week's epistle reading comes from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, on page 197 of the New Testament of your Pew Bible. Continuing what was introduced last Sunday about the book of Hebrews, today's passage explains that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, He entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Mark chapter 12. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he had answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. The Gospel of our Lord. For those of you who weren't here last Sunday, we uh, had some folks up here and we asked them, what do you like or love about St. Paul? This is in keeping with our stewardship time and how we can give to God through St. Paul Church and its wonderful ministries. So I want to read some excerpts of that from those of you who gave cards. Since you weren't up here, some of you were invited, all of you were invited to put something down on a card and I would like to read some excerpts that'll take a minute or two and well worth the reading and hearing. Why I love St. Paul. The people at St. Paul don't look down on me. They accept me for who I am. We know each other and love to be together. The faith of our community is what makes St. Paul. This small, beautiful church filled with welcoming people The sermon by Reverend Mercer gives me knowledge, peace, and strength through God. It is a blessing. Sunday School. The joy and peace I leave with the choir and music. 
Even though I'm not from Palatine, I have always felt welcomed here. I love the friendly, loving feeling at St. Paul's. I look forward to the sermons. I like the family-like congregation. And finally, it's a reminder to remain humble. Thank you. You know, one of the things that baffles foreigners, people from overseas, when they visit our country here, the United States, is our American habit of asking people how they're doing. I remember that just blew international students' mind when we would walk across the quad on campus and say, how you're doing, and they would stop and give us a long monologue about how they were actually doing, and we were equally surprised that they did so. Uh, this is a, a form of greeting in the United States. It is not really an honest, heartfelt inquiry into the general well-being of the other person. It is simply our way of saying hello. But of course, saying, how you doing, that's, that's not really new to American society. Back in the days when American society still possessed the attributes of elegance and class, um, we had a, a more formal, stylized way of greeting one another. Maybe a, with the tip of the hat, we would say, how do you do? But it was essentially the same thing. We didn't really want to know how they were doing. We were just doing that as a form of greeting. Now, we know, too, that the English language has undergone a great deal of debasement over the years, and all for the purpose of making things simpler and streamlined. We have seen this with the use of acronyms in email that we send to one another, and more recently with the use of emojis that we send in text messages, little smiley faces and various other facial expressions we use in place of words. Maybe, maybe it is our part of our basic nature that we want things kind of distilled down. We want a simpler version, and so we do that with our language. Yes, we want people to know that we recognize their basic humanity, and that's why we say, how you doing? It's kind of a distilled down version of, of a greeting, but we really don't want to know how their life is going. But along these same lines, that's why the Reader's Digest has condensed stories over the years, because people don't want to read the whole story. They want to read a condensed version of that. It's why bullet points are used in business communication. It's also why a scribe asked Jesus this question, which commandment is the greatest one of all? Now we actually see this same text or a, a, a variant of it shows up in the lectionary every year and we have a three year lectionary cycle. But he says, just give me the basics. Just give me the, the, the gist of it. Which commandment is the greatest one of all? Let me, let me put this in terms I think we can all relate to. How many of you here have ever read through the United States tax code? A better question is, how many of you would even want to read through the United States tax code? It's printed on two volumes, and it totals just over 2,600 pages. Is it on any of your nightstands at home, a little light reading before bedtime? You've read through the U.S. tax code. You have. Okay, we're going to talk about truth-telling in church later on. Okay, <laughs> just teasing, just teasing. It's all right. You want a summary. You don't want to read the whole thing. You just want a summary, right? If even that. Well, that's, that's really what that scribe 
was doing with, with Jesus. He was saying, don't read the whole tax code. And actually, actually, the law, he was referring to the law of Moses. And the law of Moses pales in comparison to the U.S. tax code, by the way. The law of Moses in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, contains about 613 commandments. And so that scribe was saying, just give me the bottom line. Give me, give me the, the, the gist of it. 613. Now, you may be thinking, wait a minute, I thought there were only 10. Yes, 10 of divine origin God gave Moses to give to the people of Israel the Ten Commandments. But after that, after the Ten Commandments, that, just, that was just the beginning. After the Ten Commandments were given, and my wife pointed this out to me this past week, she's kind of a historical scholar in her own right, the other 600 plus commandments were piled on by the religious leaders of the time as a way of controlling the people, believe it or not. So you have the Ten Commandments, but then after that you had the Mosaic Code, which came courtesy of what was then some semblance of the clergy. They piled on over 600 more, and it was, it, it was just a lot for them. And so they asked Jesus one day, just give us the gist of it, will you? Just, just kind of sum it up. And so Jesus said this. The most important one is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. Actually, in the great Shema, it doesn't say mind, but Jesus added mind in here. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Love God, love your neighbor. Love God with every fiber of your being. And as for your neighbor, treat, that means treating another person as though they're actually a real person. That's loving them as yourself. That's, that's the whole law of Moses summed up in one simple statement. It sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Intellectually, it's, it's easy to remember. It sounds simple. But that's where the simplicity of it ends. Jesus said that these two commandments are the greatest of all. But you and I, if we are honest with ourselves, we know that they are extremely difficult to live out. Now, why is that? Why are they so hard? Well, I'll tell you, one thing is because Human beings, we, this is, people aren't going to like this when I say it, but human beings, we people, we human beings are naturally rebellious towards God. It is in our nature that we want to do things our way rather than God's way. The first question that pops into our mind in any given situation, and I'm including myself, by the way, it's not... Hey, I wonder what God thinks of this. That's not the first question that pops into our mind. Rather, the first question that pops into our mind is, what do I stand to gain from this? And it's not even the second, third, or fourth question either. Human beings, by nature, we are rebellious creatures. We are rebellious towards God. The truth is, is that most people love God as much as rebellious teenagers love their parents. They, they like the things that God can give them. Can I have the car keys? But when it comes to obedience, it's an entirely different matter. And again, I'm telling you that I'm prone to this just as much as anyone else. But this also spills over our reluctance to love God also spills over into the way we relate to other people, our love of neighbor. We're, we're also reluctant to love our neighbor. We, we love the people who agree with us. We love the people who think the way we do. But it often ends there, too. We tend not to love those who are different. So it pretty much pretty much ends there. 
The challenge for us, and again, I'm including me going forward, is to deliberately look for ways that we can live out this greatest commandment. Love God and love our neighbor, even loving our different neighbor. You know, when it comes to loving God, one of the ways that we can do that is by supporting God's church tangibly, either with our time or with a particular skill or ability that we have or, or with our money. The church exists for the sole purpose of making God's name known in the world. And when we support that institution, that is one way that we love God with all of our being. But loving our neighbor gets even more complicated. And you know why? It's because seven days a week, we're always around our neighbor. And by our neighbor, I don't mean just necessarily next door neighbor, but all human beings. We see our neighbor, we can hear our neighbor, we can feel our neighbor. In some instances, we can smell our neighbor, or they can smell us. Did you ever hear of Aesop? You probably have. Remember Aesop's fables when you were a kid? Aesop was a Greek storyteller. And in one of his fables, Aesop said this. This was the moral of the story. Familiarity breeds contempt. Familiarity breeds contempt. And that is why we find it so hard to love our neighbor because the familiarity has bred into that. We must look for appropriate ways, and I emphasize the word appropriate, to care for one another, to love our neighbor. One of the ways we do that here in our church is we support those agencies and those organizations that care for the marginalized. But we also need to do it by Nurturing those relationships of the people that are the closest to us and not taking them for granted. Intellectually, you and I can grasp this. It's easy. We can, we can remember that going into the week. Love God, love neighbor. Yeah, piece of cake. Piece of cake only to remember, but it's a lot harder to live out. And that's our challenge, not because we need another challenge. Lord knows this life that we're living in today is extremely challenging but we do it because it is the commandment of God. And sometimes God commands us to do things that are difficult. But we're in pretty good company. All of the people in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, were called by God to do things that were anything but easy. So let's take communion and let's ask God to give us strength to live out this greatest commandment. Amen.
Please be seated. I was informed last week, um, Ethel Otto's health improved a while back. Uh, now she's not doing so well. She stopped eating and drinking. Uh, it was her, her son-in-law, Bob Danowitz, who talked to me last week, and Ethel has reached that stage. But last March, they celebrated her 101st birthday. That's, that's pretty remarkable. Eternal God, we pray for our sister Ethel Otto at this stage in her life and such a remarkable life it's been. Lord, in your mercy. Uh, we pray for Tom Donat, who has notified us that he's recovering from a minor stroke. Lord God, we thank you that he was able to communicate with us, and we pray for his continued recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, the angst and anger that is on the minds of many of us as Election Day draws near. We pray about the mood of our country and its deep divisions. Lord God Almighty, for each of us we pray that if our candidate loses, please give us the coolness of head and calmness of heart and the ability to bear it. And if our candidate wins, Please spare us from falling into the sin of insufferability and make us easy to live with. Lord, in your mercy. Does anyone have a concern or a joy that you would like to raise this morning? Thank you, Sue. Yes, Janet. Eternal God, we pray for Janet Olson's friend, Wayne, who's in the hospital with a long list of things that are complicating it. We ask for healing, Lord, in your mercy. Are there any others? Thank you again. Hi. One of my friends that has dyslexia, she said it's getting worse and worse and she has to go to the hospital. What is your friend's name? Frankie. 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 Frankie, thank you. Eternal God, we pray for Frankie's whose health is deteriorating and has to go to the hospital. We ask for healing. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Are there others? I would join that my wife is recovering from her surgery last Thursday and coming along bit by bit. Fantastic. Gracious God, we thank you that Gail Russell's surgery went well and that she is on the mend. We ask for continued healing, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for those as we do in our bulletin each week. Gracious God, today we pray for Ed and for Doris. We pray for Karen and Carol, for Nick and Michael and Ed. We pray for Elena and Jeff and Bob. We pray for Matthew and Michael and Carol. We pray for the Hernandez family. We pray for Larry and Ashley, Bruce and Barb and Jay and Leland. We pray for Larry and Stan and Russell and Ethel and Holly. We pray for John and Kathy and Mary and Sharon. We pray for Bonnie and Sherry Beverly, Roseanne, Mako, and Dolores. Gracious God, these prayers, spoken and unspoken, we bring all of them to your throne of grace this morning, trusting in your mercy, which is new every morning and from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. In my life, Lord, be 
Please be seated. We practice open table in the United Church of Christ. All fellow believers in Jesus Christ are invited to participate. Hear the words of institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ as they have been given to us by the Apostle Paul. For what I received from the Lord I handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said to them, Take and eat. This is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, in the same way also, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as we partake of this bread and of this cup, we do so to proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray together as Christ our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God come to the Lord's table, for all things are now ready. Set free 
worship the Lord, all you people. You want for nothing if you ask. Taste and see that the Lord is good. In God we need put all our trust. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Soaring s 
Spirit sing Fair is the sunshine Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In your rising up and in your lying down, in your going out and in your coming in, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears, until you stand before Jesus on that day when there will be no sunset and no dawn. Amen.